Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing how science can save oceans with Dr. Jim Sullivan. It's all on you, Jim. You say you have to save the ocean. You have uh, two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, Executive Director of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic uh, University. And I'm so excited to be here, Jim, to talk with you about uh, about this really, really important uh, topic. So thank you from uh, to, uh, for coming to us from hurricane-ridden uh, Florida. Well, thanks for having me. It's um, a topic I really enjoy. Well, I don't enjoy talking about it um, in some ways, but it's a topic that's really important that people understand. So when I was coming up, you know, we used to, we used to uh, see these, um, these sci-fi movies where you know, scientists were the voice of reason. They were the ones who saw things first. You know, the the, the film would would always go to people listening in rapt attention as as scientists were describing uh, problems and rational solutions and so on. And now we're we're at the point where uh, disinformation is king and and truth and uh, obfuscation are given equal weight. Could you uh, talk with us in that? Uh, 1950s sci-fi way is the voice of scientific reason, and we can all sit at the edge of our seats and hang on your every word. Could you could you really describe, and in all seriousness, describe the situation with the oceans because they're not an infinite res- uh, uh, resource anymore. Human impact is felt from the Antarctic to the Arctic. Um, talk a little bit about your take on the state of the oceans today. <clears throat> Um, you know, the oceans at this point, everyone's familiar with global warming. I, I don't, I think we can all agree it's actually occurring now. And of course, with global warming, which is a, a byproduct of CO2 pollution, we have climate change, which we're witnessing, unfortunately, across the world. But we also have ocean acidification, which is dropping the pH and making, as it sounds like, the oceans more acidic. And you might not think, well, you know, how is that bad? But it really affects a lot of marine life. A lot of animals that need to form shells and other structures like coral, they can't do it in an acidic ocean. So you can see entire food chains collapse over just acidification. It changes the chemistry of the oceans. Um, But global warming is just one thing that we're doing. And this is a a, a huge issue. But the oceans have been having really significant damaging effects from mankind for, well, since mankind's been around. And beyond just the, the big picture of, of global warming, we are now seeing um, you know, coral reefs dying out. We're seeing biodiversity loss in our oceans, which is a huge issue. Uh, overfishing, we've pretty much exploited our oceans for all the food we can pull out of them. You know, fishing has basically peaked now. We can't take much more out of the oceans. Other forms of pollution besides CO2 that we put in the atmosphere, um, plastics are a major issue in the ocean now, microplastics. People have probably heard of the great Pacific garbage patch, mostly plastics. Um, And nutrient pollution, we all like to live by the coast. Coastlines are very beautiful, but we get a lot of uh, pollution from farming, from septic systems, from industrial use, um, you name it. It happens. And that causes things like harmful algal blooms on our coasts, which are are huge issues. Um, It's just the oceans can't take continued punishment. At some point, we're going to hit tipping points on a lot of issues. And we have to take control of this and start trying to restore our oceans and not just keep on pounding them. They'll, They'll recover if we give them a chance to recover but we're hitting them with a lot of different problems simultaneously. Now, theoretically, we should be uh, smart enough to actually see this, this coming. I mean, we're, we're seeing hurricanes of a, of a power um, on a regular basis that we had never seen before. So you see the actual impact of global warming. You see the melting of the ice caps, which is not something uh, we had seen. And it's, it's happening at a very... Uh, accelerated uh, rate. You know, the microplastic situation, all you have to do is is look at a glass of water and you think, well, there's a portion of this, this is, um, that, that I'm drinking here is plastic. So I'm going to be 
ingesting these plastics. We've seen and we're finding them in we're finding microplastics in humans now. I mean, it's you right. know. And, and, and you're seeing, right, where, where, where rivers die and then they wash into the ocean. Well, that death is washing into the, into the ocean and the death is caused by uh, pollution and, and forever, forever um, uh, pollutants. How do we shift this? Because we can't turn it off like a light switch, right? What kinds of actions can we take in our everyday lives that attach to the science that actually allows me to make a contribution to solving this problem. In other words, when I when I get up off of this chair and I exit where I am, what is what are the behaviors when I go into a restaurant, when I go and I make a purchase, when I go and uh, get into a car? What are the behaviors that actually allow us to to solve this in a way that is scientifically valid? Um. It's a really good question, and it's one I think most scientists struggle with. You know, if I start telling someone about global warming or climate change, individuals can't stop global warming. That is not, you know, while we can all try to live a better life and try to, you know, be carbon neutral and all that, really that's the job of countries and governments to take corrective action on large scale policies. It's very difficult. However, I think we need to, you know, educate people on issues that they can control, such as plastics pollution. Don't use single use plastics. Don't use that disposable water bottle. Make sure things are, are put into the right kind of trash container so they don't end up in the oceans or in rivers and get washed into the ocean. Same thing with nutrients. I mean, humans do a lot of pollution. Don't over fertilize your lawn. A simple step you can take. Listen to your local county regulations on, you know, keeping your septic system up to date if you have one or having a regular pump and inspect it. There's a lot of those kind of actions that are very personal that people can do. And it's really important if enough people get together and do it, it does make a difference. You know, asking people to stop global warming, as I said, is not probably a realistic thing to do. We have to depend that our politicians will listen to us and take the large scale corrective action. And that's what I would say is another really critical thing that individuals can do. And that's becoming educated on the issues and then becoming politically active. And I only mean, you just have to vote. Vote for candidates, doesn't matter what party, that you see are working on the problem. That they look, they support what we're doing, they support conservation efforts, they support trying to work towards healthier oceans. That's critically important to change political will. I mean, we re- and we can all do that. So do you think that, that, that this is where we seem to be getting into trouble? Because um, if, if you're talking about overfishing and I'm in the fishing business, yep. right? You're, you're urging me to fish less mm-hmm. or fish differently or catch different things or, 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 um, or uh, cultivate fish instead of going and catching wild fish, right? you're going to affect my business. If you're trying to suggest that maybe we shouldn't be transporting goods all over the ocean for each part of the supply chain, because that's putting pollution into the oceans and it's, it's uh, causing the use of fossil fuels to transport, you're affecting my business. Are, are we in this situation where almost anything you do is going to affect somebody. And so a good way to defend my business and the way I behave is to undermine your scientific perspective. And basically, instead of of listening to the science, basically figuring out a way to get that science discarded. And and how do we change that? Because that's it seems to to me that that while governments are the solution to a lot of things, it's the collective action vehicle that we all have. I think we actually have a human issue of, of how we are going to interact with science. And let's get, we're going to talk in the next uh, bit about the science that you are doing. Uh, but but is there an issue here that we have to start thinking in terms of how we interact with our world in a way that makes it more sustainable so that our kids and grandkids can enjoy it as well. Yeah, and it, it's a very difficult problem, but I, I think, you know, environmentalists, scientists, we all have to be realistic. 
You know, we can say, well, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, that'll save the world. But it's not realistic to all of a sudden stop business. You know, when the pan, a good example is when the pandemic hit, we saw a massive change in air pollution over major cities because people weren't driving, people weren't going to work, they were staying at home. That was great for the atmosphere temporarily, but we can't realistically expect people to just stop what they're doing. So we have to provide alternatives. We have to provide better ways of doing things so it's more efficient. I mean, we have to work with people and their interests as well. So you can't, you can't just dictate that, oh, it's going to be this way. For some things you may have to because it's the only solution. <clears throat> For example, certain fisheries that essentially are, are tapped out, you may have to put quotas and limits on them. You just well, that's what they did with the Monterey uh, fishery when it, w w I mean, right. a very famous um, example of where an entire fishery collapsed after the season where they had the maximum harvest that they'd ever had. And yep. the next year it was all gone. I mean, just right. gone. <clears throat> right. And that's, you know, and that's where a scientist can actually be instructive. They can say, OK, you know, we're putting in quotas, but we're doing this to save your job, because if you don't do this, our prediction is the fishery will collapse and then you're not going to have a job at all. So would you rather have, have some living or no living at all? And that is an, a, a good example of, OK, you know, they kind of saw it coming. Now, we're now seeing this in the Alaskan crab fishery, where this is an I intersection know. of global you know, warming, uh, the ocean's warming, which is another huge issue, part of global warming, um, where the fishery itself, you know, the animals can't take that slight change in temperature. They either start to cannibalize each other or move to colder waters, and they're suddenly not accessible to a fishery. That fishery basically shuts down. So, I mean, at some point, People have to realize that we're science and environmentalists. We're not against people. We're trying to protect them. I mean, we're trying to protect people's livelihoods and the oceans at the same time. I mean, but it's a difficult balancing act. It's, it's really hard. I'm not the saying crab fishery, to... the crab fisheries are such a great example because it's just happened, right? I mean, right. basically, um, it it was a slow moving problem that some people were warning of, but you couldn't feel it until now it basically shuts it down is that is that fishery totally shut down at this point i believe they stopped the harvest for this year yeah so and but i do think i, I thought and don't i mean i'm not going to say that this is gospel but i thought the people doing looking at the juvenile recruitment they actually had a good recruiting class of larval crabs this year so there's hope that the fishery itself will rebound if they, you know, like I said, you put in a quota or you stop it for a year or two and let, let the population regrow, it doesn't solve the underlying issue, though. And the underlying issue is the water's getting too warm for that species of crab. It needs to move to colder water. We see this on the east coast of the United States where entire fisheries start migrating north. American lobster, very the American lobster, right? So uh, Maine is moving now into Canada, and uh, and you have that whole uh, fishery that is uh, basically um, uh, in in a slow decline, but a but a consistent decline. And and there you have a border, so now you can't just migrate north. At a certain point, you get into the territory waters of another country, and then what do you do, right? Yeah, I mean, it's good. It could be good for Canadian fish, you know, fishermen. It might not be good, <laughs> so good for the American fishermen. Um, but that's, you know, that's a problem that's not going to go away easily. And there's no real regulation you can put in to fix that problem. It's just what nature's doing. On the flip side, we have the other way where organisms and, you know, different animals that live in warmer waters down by the equator or the Caribbean are now able to come further north because it's warmer water. Right. So we can start seeing this with things like harmful algal blooms on our coast, where species that, of algae that wouldn't have been able to survive in our waters due to winter and, and cold water can suddenly persist. And we have these lingering problems that if it wasn't for the temperature of the water, we wouldn't have. So it's, um, there's not a lot we can do about it, you know, short of reversing the climate trend. So talk a little bit about how you determine as the executive director of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, 
at Florida Atlantic University. How do you set your research agenda on an annual basis? How do you also decide what grants you're going to go after? Because, you know, if you're just chasing money, then you can be all over the place and, and the research doesn't connect and it doesn't necessarily connect to your competency. Um, on the other hand, you are following certain uh, areas where uh, where funding might be available. How do you create that balance and you uh, assure that that the organization is sustainable itself as it pursues sustainability in the environment? That's a great question. And that, I mean, this is one of the reasons why, you know, all institutes do strategic planning, but we, you know, we constantly update our strategic plans due to where federal priorities happen to be. I mean, it's a moving target. Federal priorities change with administrations or problems that are going on. Um, but we have four core areas that we work in and our faculty work in. One is marine conservation. So we study, you know, all kinds of animals from viruses to whales. So we get it pretty much covered. But also, you know, looking at fisheries, looking at marine mammal health, um, you know, looking at coral reef health, seagrass health, all those things fit with other conservation efforts. And we go where the money is and we try to develop programs where we can get funding in there. We have a very large aquaculture program here. Uh, one of the largest aquaculture facilities in the state of Florida. We have a really large project with the USDA, a reoccurring funding from the government to improve U.S. industry in aquaculture. We lag way behind the rest of the world right now. It's, um, you know, we were talking about seafood and, and fishing. 50% of the seafood we now eat comes from aquaculture. It's not wild caught anymore, half of it. Unfortunately, of that 50% that is grown, you know, a very small, I think it's less than 5%, is actually produced by the United States. So it's a huge trade deficit for us. It's, it's a big problem. And we, we work on that and we work with the government to try to make the U.S. better at it. We also use aquaculture for restoration efforts, rest, restoring coral reefs, restoring seagrass, restoring fish species that are being overfished or need to be restocked, just like you restock a pond. Right, coral, coral reefs. I was just uh, over at um, at uh, Mystic Aquarium where we're doing the search for their for their CEO, and I was talking with uh, a jellyfish guy who was talking about, you know, growing jellyfish and, and using jellyfish not only for the exhibits for educational purposes, but also as a food source for other species that consume turtles, those, yeah, turtles, uh, like them. <laughs> turtles, turtles, and and um, and other and other species. The thing is, is that. If we're if we're growing these um, these organisms for uh, animals, um, and if we are uh, confronting an overfishing uh, uh, catastrophe in our oceans, um, why isn't the uh, United States more on top of this uh, this industry? Because there there is there is real um, uh, there's a real economy here that we could be um, a leader in. Well, and I, I think part of it is straight economy. So most of the aquaculture in the world is done in Asian countries. And right. traditionally, they don't operate under the same regu environmental regulations. So they might be able to do things um, quite a bit cheaper. Labor mm -hmm. costs can obviously be cheaper in some um, countries compared to the United States. So they can essentially undercut U.S. producers. Right. But... There comes a point where, okay, we can actually compete. If we're efficient and we're good at it, we can make it profitable for U.S. industry. And that's where our research comes in, to make it profitable, to make it something that where we can compete with these other global interests that have been doing it far longer than we have more successfully. So that's exactly what we're working on, is so here's, to make it better. Here's, here's the interesting dynamic, right? On the one hand, universities are the vehicles of, of business uh, trying to help these industries compete. On the other hand, in, um, scientists can be providing data that industries don't welcome because it, it requires them to change. How do you create that relationship that is respectful, productive for all sides creates a change in behavior that is also based on economic sustainability because sustainability is not just about environmental sustainability. People need jobs, mm -hmm. right? And, and we need work product in this country. How do you create that, that new balance 
Um, and, and what kind of, uh, of relationships and conversations do you enter into in order to drive forward that sort of beneficial relationship between uh, scientists and, and uh, industrial economic interests uh, here in the United States? Yeah, it's it's difficult because science really has to be careful about, you know, taking political stances or taking, oh, we're going to support this business over that business. Right. I mean, science should be generic and for the purpose of just benefiting society. And neutral, the quest for knowledge, right? And neutral. But I will say that, you know, in the I would say in the last decade, science, there's been more of a drive from governmental funding for science for it to be societally relevant. In other words, research in a vacuum doesn't do anything for anybody. It's the application of that research to benefit society that's important. So we here, we do a lot of um, ocean technology development and innovation. We do that as scientists, but we give that over to industry to develop and use and make money off because we're not going to run. We're not going to do it as a university, but that's where we're promoting business and trying to help businesses like agriculture technology. We do ocean health and human health research here where we're trying to develop new, um, new drugs and new therapies for cancer using natural products from the ocean. Again, we can develop and find a promising drug and hand it over to a, pharma a pharmaceutical company. So again, we're helping society and then it, it, it gets into the business realm and other people can be successful with it and make money. So we do a mix of both, but I would say most of our research now is applied and should have some relevance to help society. I mean, that's, I think, that's where we are. I think that whole, that idea of relevance to help society, right? Knowledge is neutral. Yeah. Knowledge just is a benefit in and of itself. It's that it's, then it's how you apply that knowledge, yep. right? So you could take a knowledge and find that you have been able to, um, to, um, identify a substance that has an effect on the human body that if it's used in one way can poison it and, a, and another way can heal it, right? So you're, you're, how you actually apply it, the, the whole idea of scientific ethics is really about the downstream impacts of research and how that's deployed. And that really does take um, education, knowledge exchange, uh, sharing of, of values and, uh, and engagement across different boundaries. And do you actually have engagement with um, community interests, business interests, governmental interests, and so on, in terms of, of your decision making as to what you study and, and how that that knowledge is is shared uh, outright? Do you have boards and ad advisors uh, that that cross different uh, sectors outside of the university environment? We do. Um, you know, we try to stay very active with our local counties, our state government, our federal government. I go to D.C. and talk to senators and congresspeople about um, these are things we'd like to see the government support because we think they're important and, you know, they're research that we can do. Environmentalist business interests and so on. Do you? Right. No, exactly. And I, we have, we work with a, our particular institute works with a lot of corporate partners. For instance, we work with a lot of DOD interests. Um, we do a lot of DOD research here because the ocean is used by the Navy and other you know, um, groups. But we work with um, a real lot of corporations helping them carry out their research you know, where they might not have expertise, but we do. We do that all the time. Um, very, very common. I would say, though, a lot of professors also interact directly. For instance, I'll give you... Here's an example. I was appointed by our governor to serve on his Blue Green Algal Task Force. So this is a group of scientists who advise the state how to deal with a problem we're having right now, these toxic algae blooms in our, our freshwater reservoirs and, and sources. And they're toxic to humans and they're dangerous to the population potentially. And it's straight volunteer effort. I don't get paid for it. And I just advise the state government on here. This is the kind of research we can do this is what we think will help and, and, and just make um, recommendations to them. A lot of scientists do that. Many scientists volunteer their time to help out state businesses. We serve on boards. Almost everyone here will serve on some national board. And that's pretty common across all universities. 
So it's so it's so important. You know, we've we've uh, interviewed people like Ducks Unlimited. We've, we've interviewed uh, various conservation organizations, the Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club, and so on. A Chamber of Commerce's um, uh, um, CEOs of, of large businesses, always about surrounding um, nonprofit uh, type organizations, issues, and leaders. And what you find is that if we talk to each other and we learn from each other's perspective, we can actually improve the outcomes that we're all pursuing in our different ways. And we can find ways to triangulate against interests that seem to be diametrically opposed, but really aren't, because we do have a shared objective. We want to make the earth livable. We want to we want to make this a good and prosperous uh, country for, for all of its citizens. And so yeah. with that common objective, we can get over those divisions. We can, and you know, we, we call it the blue economy. So the oceans and our, our freshwater resources are incredibly important to the economies of so many states and the nation. I mean, it's a huge issue. And yes, clean water and a, a good and healthy environment is part of that. I mean, if you're gonna have tourism based on you know the beauty of a beach or something, hey, that benefits the hotel owner, it benefits the, the people running restaurants, but it also benefits nature that we actually are trying to keep it clean. And we always now think in terms of the blue economy, you know, that's how we can get businesses interested in what we do. We can get politicians interested in, in it. And it's, it's good for business. And we both want the same thing, maybe for slightly different reasons. And, <laughs> well, good, good, and good for life, good for Florida. Dr. Jim Sullivan, executive director of the uh, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives, your research, the the work of your colleagues uh, there, your donors, your students, your volunteers. Uh, this has just been a terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your knowledge. Uh, thank, thank you for having me.